Hi everyone, this video is part three in the 2A series for AP Psychology students in the Cognition Unit. This particular video focuses on thinking and problem solving. So let me start by putting this video into context. As you can see, we're looking at the unit as a whole, and you know already that I've divided this unit into two parts, part A and part B. And this particular video is the third video in the section I'm calling 2A. And this video covers the topics that are listed within objective 2.2 in the College Board's CED for AP Psychology students. Throughout this video, I will cover a few major topics that are related to thinking and problem solving, and they follow these questions. By the end of the video, you should be able to answer each one of them. All of the concepts listed on the screen will be explained throughout today's lesson. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So today's focus is on thinking and problem solving, and these are elements of cognition. These tasks involve interpreting and manipulating information in our minds. These are higher ordered thinking mechanisms that are called executive functions. These are functions that allow us to generate, organize, plan, and carry out goal oriented behaviors and think critically. These executive functions are processed in our prefrontal cortexes. They are advanced cognitive abilities that set us apart as humans. It enables us to solve complex problems, um, adapt creatively, and focus on and overcome new challenges. So let's start with some basic terms related to how our minds categorize information. Concepts and prototypes play an important role in simplifying complex ideas and help us make sense of the world around us. Concepts are mental groupings of similar objects, events, ideas, or people that help us organize and understand the world. Concepts allow us to categorize things in our minds based on shared qualities or characteristics. This makes it easier for us to process and recall information. For example, the concept of chair encompasses all of the objects that we sit in, even if they vary in size or color or style, lawn chairs, recliners, dental chairs, barber chairs, wheelchairs, high chairs, these are all chairs and they fit this characteristic of things that we sit on. And this is our concept for chair. It's just a mental shortcut for us to help uh, recognize objects in different contexts without needing to relearn each individual object every time we encounter a new one. If you were to ask a group of people to describe what comes to mind when they think of the word chair, they would likely describe their prototype, which is the mental image they have that represents their concept. The prototype is the ideal version of a category in our minds, and it's the best example of that concept. When I think of the concept of chair, my prototype is a simple wooden four-legged chair. If we encounter a beanbag chair or a bar stool, we would compare these objects to our prototype to determine if they fit into the concept of chair. Prototypes make it easier to identify objects and categorize them, helping us process our environment more efficiently. So to summarize, concepts are general mental categories in which similar objects can be grouped, whereas prototypes are the mental image that represents that concept. So now that we have a basic understanding of how we categorize information in our brains, let's build on how we encounter new information and organize it. So as we acquire new information, we develop what's called schemas. And then we either assimilate information into our existing schemas or we accommodate them to create new schemas. Here's how this works. A schema is a mental framework of ideas and expectations that we develop through experience. Schemas are similar to concepts, but they can be more complex, encompassing related concepts within a larger framework. For example, a child might have a schema for farm as a place where cows and pigs and chickens live. They may have encountered this information in a book that was read to them by their parents, but with limited life experience, their framework relies on the simple idea of a farm being where you can find cows, pigs, and chickens. 
as the child learns more about the world, and in this case, farms, they will either assimilate new information into their schema or modify it through accommodation. Assimilation happens when new information fits into what you already know, or it nicely fits into your existing schema without having to change it. For example, if the child visits a farm and sees horses, knowing that a farm contains animals, the child might add horses to their schema of farm animals. Accommodation occurs when new information doesn't fit in with the existing schema, so you're forced to change or modify it. So as the child learns that some farms only grow crops and don't have animals, they will need to adjust their idea of what a farm can be to include farms that grow food. This mental process is called accommodation. So when new information forces an existing schema to be modified, this is what's called accommodation. So now now let's talk about problem solving. Every day we encounter problems, some big, some small. And the process by which we approach this obstacle and how we work through it is referred to as problem solving. And this is a cognitive process that happens in the prefrontal cortex. There are three major problem solving methods. They are trial and error, heuristics, and algorithms. And each method has its own set of advantages and disadvantages, which are important to understand when choosing the best approach to a given problem. The first is trial and error, and this method involves trying out multiple different possibilities in order to find a solution. For example, you might test different combinations of ingredients together until the food tastes just right. The advantage of trial and error is that it allows for individuals to have discovery and exploration, and you can learn from your mistakes. However, it can be time consuming and it can use up your resources and your success is not guaranteed. So this method does not have a certainty that you will get to your desired result. The next problem solving method is heuristics. This approach uses a rule of thumb or general guidelines rather than a step-by-step -step process. For instance, you might use a pinch of salt in a recipe instead of measuring exactly the right amount of salt you need. Heuristics offer a quick and easy approach to a solution by simplifying the task and reducing the mental effort. However, they might not always produce the desired outcome, and heuristics can be prone to cognitive biases, which potentially lead to um, unsuitable solutions. And finally, the last method of problem solving is an algorithm. Algorithms are methods that involve following a set of step-by-step -step logical instructions, or an outlined set of procedures that you follow in order to achieve a specific outcome. For example, you might follow a recipe precisely when you prepare a meal. The advantage of algorithms is that they produce precise and accurate solutions, ensuring that you will have a reliable and consistent outcome. However, the downside of algorithms as methods of problem solving is that they can be time consuming and complicated. They can require careful attention to instructions and you also must have the necessary resources. As you just learned, heuristics are mental shortcuts or a rule of thumb that allows you to simplify the decision-making and problem-solving process. They can help you make decisions quickly by reducing the cognitive effort required. However, heuristics can lead to errors in our judgment because they rely on an oversimplified assumption. Here are two examples of heuristics we might use in our day-to-day decision-making. The first is the representativeness heuristic. This type of mental shortcut is one that you use when you make a judgment based on a prototype or a stereotype that you have. You make a quick judgment or decision based on something you encounter and how it resembles that prototype. You could be correct in your judgment, but you could also be incorrect. For example, suppose you meet a woman who shares with you how much she loves working with people for a living, and you might quickly compare that to a prototype you have and assume that she she is a teacher or a nurse. This was a quick mental judgment based on a representation you have of women in the workplace. However, this judgment could lead you astray if you find out that she is a CEO of a large company or a lawyer who represents a diverse group of people in her city.
The second heuristic is called the availability heuristic, which involves estimating the likelihood of an event based on how easily examples come to mind. If something is more memorable or more recent in your mind, then you might assume that it's more likely or more common or more likely to occur. And you might make a decision based on this information being more readily available in your memory rather than how likely it is to occur. For instance, if you recently heard a news report about plane crash crashes, you might overestimate the risk of flying, even though statistically flying is much safer than driving. So as we talk about decision making, there are multiple factors that influence the decisions we make. And you need to be familiar with these three factors, priming, framing, and mental set. Priming is a psychological phenomenon where exposure to a stimulus influence how we respond to a subsequent stimulus, often without even being aware of it. Priming prepares or activates associations in your mind, affecting the way we think and process information. For example, if you are shown a series of pictures of bread and then asked to complete the following puzzles, you can see this in problem number one on the screen, you might be more likely to complete the words as butter and toast instead of butler and toads. And the reason is seeing the stimulus of bread prior to being presented with this problem primed you to answer in that way. Framing is similar, except it has to do with how the information itself is presented to you, and that is what influences your decision making. So for example, if a health campaign presents a new dietary guideline as 90% effective in reducing heart disease, you might feel more positive about that guideline rather than if it was presented in the inverse way. If they said 10% of people still get heart disease despite following this new health guideline, your response would likely be less favorable. And it just has to do with how they conveyed or framed that same information. So another way that you can be influenced in your decision-making is through your mental set. And mental set is the tendency to approach a problem in one particular way, usually a way that you've been successful in the past. We often use that mental set even if there is a better approach. Our mental sets can help us, but they can also make it difficult for us to consider other solutions when we think that we already have one, even though it might not be the most optimal approach. Here's an example of a mental set. Let me give you a problem to solve. What are the final three letters that complete the statement number one in problem number two? The statement goes O, T, T, F, blank, blank, blank. Most people will have difficulty recognizing that these are the first letters in the words one, two, three, four. So then the next words would be five, six, seven, or F, S, S. So now that you can see the problem in this way, and I've given you a solution or a framework in which to solve it, let me give you another example. Number two says J, F, M, A, blank, blank, blank. What are the next three letters? You can pause and think for a little bit if you would like to um, process this, but I'll give you a clue if you need it. Here's a hint. What month is it? Okay, did, did that give you a clue and hint? Um, what should come next are M, J, J, which stands for May, June, July. This likely would have been easier for you this second time because you had a framework already to approach it with or a mental set. And as you learned in a previous video, we also have what's called perceptual sets. Those predispose us to perceive something in a certain way, whereas mental sets predispose us to think about something in a certain way. And sometimes these can be obstacles to us. And here's an example. Take a look at this matchstick problem and try to determine how you could rearrange them in a way to form four equilateral triangles. I'll share the answer on the next slide, so pause the video here if you'd like to think about it a little bit longer.
So oftentimes students struggle with the matchstick problem because of their mental set. They approach it with the framework they were given of the matchsticks lying flat, but you can actually make four equilateral triangles, but the only way to do it is to view it from a different perspective than the one you were given with. You can see the, the matchsticks standing up, creating a three-dimensional pyramid, and that will give you four equilateral triangles. So next let's talk about fallacies that affect good decision making. The College Board wants students to be familiar with two fallacies that hinder effective and accurate decisions. They are the gambler's fallacy and the sunk cost fallacy. The gambler's fallacy is a cognitive bias where individuals are led to believe that previous random events affect the likelihood of future random events, even though each event is independent from one another. Essentially, it's the mistaken belief that after a series of particular outcomes, a different outcome is more likely to occur. For example, suppose you were to flip a coin five times and each time it lands on heads you might wrongly assume that the next flip is more likely to be tails because of the previous five heads. This is the gambler's fallacy because the next flip still has the same 50% chance of being heads or tails, regardless of what happened in the previous five flips. The sunk cost fallacy is another cognitive bias that could lead to bad decision making because you might continue to do a task based on how much you've already invested in it, even if it isn't worth it. In other words, the sunk cost fallacy is the tendency to stick with a bad decision because of what has already been invested, whether it's time or money or resources, even if it no longer makes sense to continue. So our final topic is creativity. And creativity is a cognitive process that involves the ability to generate and develop new ideas and ways of thinking. Creativity takes place anytime someone has an original idea and it allows them to create something new and valuable. Creativity is important when faced with a tricky problem to solve. Sometimes people struggle with coming up with new ideas or even ways of using everyday objects. And this is called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness prevents people from thinking outside of the box and finding new solutions to problems. It limits how they use familiar objects, restricting creative problem solving. Functional fixedness can be defined like this. It's the tendency to see objects only in terms of their intended and traditional and conventional uses. So for example, you might need a small hook and decide to go out and buy one even though you have a full pack of paper clips in your desk drawer. Functional fixedness cause you to perceive those paper clips as items that can only hold things together, rather than bending them and making a makeshift hook. Lastly, it's important for students to be able to explain the difference between divergent and convergent thinking. Divergent thinking is a creative approach to problem solving. This occurs when a problem has multiple solutions, whereas convergent thinking is a situation in which a problem has just one solution. And in that case, the person would need to use convergent thinking to narrow down the options to find the single correct answer. And these topics cover what you need to know about creativity. So let's finish today's video with a few short questions for review. I will read the questions out loud, but not the answers. So be sure to pause the video if you need some extra time to process the responses. I will share the correct answers at the end. Number one says to find the best route to work, Vlad identified all routes and eliminated options one by one. Which of the following did Vlad use? Question number two says your teacher asks how many uses you can think of for a pencil. She is testing your Question number three says, when asked to think of a ball, Carlos quickly thought of images of baseballs, basketballs, and footballs. Which psychological concept best applies to this scenario? Question number four says, to solve a calculus problem, Ridge uses the same logical and methodical rule that guarantees a solution. Ridge uses a or an... Question number five says, after seeing a news story about a kidnapping, Odessa felt more afraid that her children would be kidnapped, even though it is a very rare occurrence. Which of the following psychological concepts best applies to this scenario? So this concludes today's video on thinking and problem solving. Listed on the left-hand side of the screen are the answers to the review questions, and on the right are the questions and concepts. Before finishing up, take a minute to check your understanding of these essential concepts and elements of today's video.